Good morning. I want to say we're glad you're with us today. We thank you for tuning in. If you're listening on the radio or watching on YouTube, we're grateful for your visit as well. Uh, in our prayer this morning, let's uh, remember folks that we have that are on our prayer list and uh, some updates I'll give you about some folks. Uh, Don Roberts, Don had three stints, but he's Iron Man. He's here today. Uh, Thelma Wilbur, the sister-in-law of Melinda Sewell, is on our prayer list. Patricia Robinson, we found out this past week she uh, has been in the hospital. Uh, and that, the only way we can know these things is that you have to tell us. God does not give us direct lines. And in 35 years of preaching, I have learned not to take responsibility for things I'm not told. Uh, Preston Carey uh, fell, broke his hip, and he is in the Sumner Regional Hospital and will be moved to rehab this week. Uh, Jimmy Gentry, uh, this is uh, Brenda Roberts' brother. Uh, he's been on our prayer list for a long time. He has uh, liver failure, but uh, good news is, is that he received a, a liver transplant and so uh, he is recuperating from that surgery, and we're glad to hear that. Um, any update on anyone else that you know of today? Not all is well? All right, then, let's all bow in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful this morning, and we are grateful for the night's rest, and we thank you for today that we have this first day of the week as we assemble as your, your people. We do come in, in grateful hearts uh, and, and praise to, to you. Our Father, we pray for those that are sick. We're grateful for those who have been in the hospital and now been released. We also are grateful, Father, that uh, those in the hospital are improving. We're thankful that uh, Jimmy has received this uh, new liver. We pray that this transplant will be successful. His health could be restored, and he could be returned to his home soon. Uh, we pray for Preston as he's uh, uh, undergoing this uh, issue of a broken hip, and may his health uh, be restored as well. Our Father, we pray for others on our prayer list who are dealing with cancer and other health problems. We pray for each one that you would suit them their needs. As we uh, continue in this prayer, we're mindful of, of, uh, of your great love and your word. We pray today as we study, you'll open our hearts and our ears and our eyes. These things we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, now if you have your Bible, open it with me to the book of Matthew, and we're in the 23rd chapter here as we're starting in chapter 23. Uh, chapter 23, as you... If you have read, you'll see and notice that it is a chapter that has a stern warning. And uh, this is the um, last lesson, last sermon, any, any way you want to put it, that Jesus will preach to the people. <clears throat> Following this, he'll talk and teach his disciples. Uh, but to the people in general, this is the last uh, that he will uh, say to them. <clears throat> He will be crucified on Friday and raised from uh, the grave on Sunday. And so prior to his crucifixion, uh, he sp spends this time in warning them about false uh, spiritual leaders, false teachers. Uh, the first 12 verses is where we are as we're looking at it today. And uh, I think we got down into about verse 2 there as he's talking here in this translation it, it says, teachers of the law, your, may, your translation may read scribes. Uh, uh, scribes were seen as teachers of the law because of their occupation. They, they spent their whole life copying the law. And if you want to uh, memorize something, if you want to learn something, then that's a good way to do it. Uh, when I was in school, I went to school twice. The first time didn't count. And so I went back a second time, and I had to try to figure out a better way to study. And what I discovered in my approach to studying uh, better was to copy things and recopy things. 
I heard the old story one time about a fellow who copied his notes and memorized uh, his notes, and he'd copy them again and copy them again until he finally got it down to where he just had one word. And that one word would automatically uh, give him the answers that he was seeking. But he forgot what that one word was. So that's, that's the way I am sometimes. <laughs> but, but anyways, the, the scribes would spend their whole lives copying the law and copying the scriptures. And so that gave them uh, certainly a better understanding or maybe a uh, better memory of what the word said. And so they were considered to be the teachers of the law. And they were Pharisees. All scribes were, were Pharisees. Not all Pharisees were scribes. But all the scribes were Pharisees. And uh, when we talked last week, I was describing for you, giving you a, uh, a brief historical look at the Pharisees and where they came from. Because when you open uh, the New Testament, you're introduced almost automatically to the Pharisees. And yet they are not mentioned in the Old Testament. So between the Old and New Testaments, when the uh, Pharisees developed and uh, came into power, uh, during that historical period of about 400 years there, uh, the power shifted back and forth between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And, uh, and there was a lot of animosity between the two uh, groups. And so by the time you get to the New Testament, the Pharisees had dominance over the uh, religious life of, of the Jews, and the Sadducees were more along the political uh, line. They had uh, kind of stepped back into the background from the Pharisees. Um, William Barclay, who, I'm sorry about this microphone, I'm not sure if it's the microphone or the water in my head or my ear, uh, my hearing aid. <laughs> uh, but uh, William Barclay is a good uh, person, a good resource to read if you're looking for historical background in, uh, in a Bible text. Uh, he's not very deep in his uh, going through the scriptures, but he does a good job in historical background. And he describes at this time uh, of the life of Christ and when he's here and he's condemning these Pharisees he describes that there were seven uh, levels or seven different types of, of Pharisees so you had the Pharisees and then you had uh, seven different types of Pharisees and this is how he labeled those seven groups of Pharisees he first called them the so uh, shoulder Pharisee shoulder Pharisees, and the reason why they were called the shoulder Pharisees is because they carried all their good deeds on their shoulders. And whenever they got, uh, uh, whenever they would get ready to pray somewhere, you know Jesus condemns that. And uh, when they get ready to pray, they would always find themselves on the street corner somewhere, and they would sprinkle their heads with ashes. And oftentimes they would paint up their faces so they looked rather pale and sunken eyed and very solemn and very uh, holy, pious type of look. And so they would display their good deeds on their shoulder, is the way Barclay described it. And then he said the second group would be a group he called the wait-a-little Pharisee. And the wait-a-little Pharisee were the Pharisees who uh, always managed to have a spiritual reason to wait a little while before doing a good deed. And so they could always postpone something that maybe they ought to be doing uh, because they had some kind of spiritual reason to postpone it. So they were called the wait a, a, wait a little Pharisee. And then you had the bruised and bloody Pharisee. And this group of Pharisees were those who believed that it was sinful for a man to look at a woman, particularly if he had lust in his heart. And so what he would do is, is that he would bow his head and shut his eyes. And as a result of that, and walking along, he'd run into a wall. And he would be bruised, and he would get uh, bloody and bleeding. And the more bruises he had, and the more he bled, the more holy he was appeared to be. So they called him the bruised and, and bloody Pharisees. So you had that group as well. And then you had another group 
that were called the humpback and tumbling Pharisees. And these are the Pharisees who try to display a, a, an attitude of humility by lowering their heads and their shoulders so that they were slumped over. And, and, and they had this position of humility, and that's how they always walked around, like that, with that position. They also believed that it was sinful for a man to lift his feet up off the ground. And so they would shuffle, shuffle their feet and, and, and do this number here. And as a result, they'd trip over things, and they would tumble and fall. And so they were called the tumbling Pharisees. Uh, I remember when I was in Jerusalem, uh, we went to the temple ruins, and uh, and then we went to the, uh, uh, <clears throat> well, I lost the name of it now. The, it's the church where uh, tradition says the Lord was buried, and uh, Holy Sepulchre, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is divided into two different religious groups. You have the Roman Catholics on one side, and you have the Greek Orthodox all in the same building but on separate sides of the building. And, and the particular day that we were there, they were ordaining a, a Orthodox bishop. And so a friend of mine, he and I were sitting on this bench and we were observing this uh, ritual, this ceremony that was going on. And, and my friend, he was just relaxing and he had his legs crossed as he was watching. And this priest, of course, they, they can speak English, but it's oftentimes very heavily accented so you can't always follow. You know, in the South, we all speak like you're supposed to speak. That's the folks in the North that's got the broke. But, but in there, you know, you had this, this bishop who came up and he reprimanded my friend. And my friend, he, didn't, he couldn't quite understand what the guy was saying. And so uh, anyways, he, he uncrossed his legs and he looked at the guy to try to follow along, still couldn't follow along. Well, when he uncrossed his legs and put his feet to the ground, the bishop turned and walked away. And he turned and put his legs back up. Well, he came back and he hit him again. And that time we figured out what was wrong. He was exposing the soles of his shoes, which, con which is considered an act of disgrace. And that's something you don't do, quote, in a sanctuary. That's not something you do in a holy place. And so here are these Pharisees, they're kind of like that, you know, you're not supposed to lift your feet off the ground and they're shuffling their feet and they tumble and they fall and so they're called the humpback tumbling Pharisees. And then there is the group called the ever reckoning Pharisees and this is a group that uh, would count their good deeds. They could start out in you know, the day by saying, well today I pray for someone or today I open the door for someone or I did this and, and so on and so forth so they could keep account of their good deeds so that they could present that to God and God could owe them that much. I don't guess they counted their bad deeds but, but anyways they're called the ever reckoning Pharisees. And then you had a group of Pharisees who were called the fearing Pharisees. And the fearing Pharisees were those who did what they did simply out of fear of going to hell. And so that's how they were motivated. And then the last group Barclay describes are called the God-fearing Pharisees. And this is the group of Pharisees that uh, were converted to Christianity later on. You remember in the book of Acts how Luke describes for us there was a number of the priests who came to the Lord. And, uh, and so there were uh, those Pharisees who were considered to be good Pharisees. You remember Paul described himself as a Pharisee among Pharisees. So they're, not all Pharisees were bad guys. There were those that were good. Now Jesus is talking to this group of uh, people and he's talking about the Pharisees and the scribes and they're present as well uh, even though he's talking to the people. Uh, the Pharisees are listening. They're, they're, they're there part of the crowd. Also the disciples are there. If you look down at verse 8 through 12 he turns his attention directly to the to his disciples uh, and, and talks to them. So you have that group here and the Lord starts out in verse 2 by talking about the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. Now there are five things I want you to see in the text here. Some of these are implied, some are direct and specific. But 
he says here five things that spiritual, false spiritual leaders lack. False spiritual leaders lack these things. And that's what he's going to talk about here. These false spiritual leaders. We'll just put false leaders there. And the first one he says is that they lack authority. Now, if you will, look in verse 2 how he describes this. This is one of those that's implied. He says here, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, let's talk about what does he mean when he says Moses' seat. They sit in Moses' seat. Every synagogue had a place designated as Moses' seat. Sometimes it was an actual chair. Uh, sometimes it wasn't. It was just a designated place. And it was the place for the leading teacher to stand or to sit, to, uh, to teach. Uh, most of the scribes and Pharisees uh, taught by sitting. You remember when Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, the Bible tells us how he starts out the Sermon on the Mount. The Bible says he goes up on the mountain and when he is seated, he begins to teach. Now the word for seat here is the word cathedra. That's Latin, uh, cathedra. The Roman Catholic Church came along and, and, and made it, took this word and, and added a, a preposition to it and called it ex cathedra. And so when the Pope speaks, he does not always speak, quote, ex cathedra. He may give his opinion about something. He may write some comment comment about something or say something to, to the parishioners, to the followers, that's not necessarily binding. It might be something that he feels that, you know, people ought to think about. Uh, but it's not necessarily binding. But when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, it is binding upon the followers of Catholicism. It is considered to be God's law. So he can sit on his throne he can sit on his seat, and as he speaks, ex cathedra. Now, he may have written it out, and it's an official document now, but he's speaking ex cathedra, and it is, and the word ex cathedra means uh, seat of authority. And so when you come here, when Jesus is talking about Moses' seat, he's talking about this place, and like I said, sometimes it was an actual chair, uh, sometimes it wasn't. But it was a place where the leading rabbi, teacher, would teach in the synagogue. And that's what he's referring to here. He says that these teachers of the law, they sit in Moses' seat, and they're taking a position of authority. And what they're teaching is they're teaching tradition. They're teaching their rules. They're teaching their regulations. They're teaching those kinds of things which are not necessarily a part of the Word of God. You see, the Jews, or, or the Pharisees, the scribes, had about 50-plus volumes of commentary on the Old Testament that had been written through the years. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, they also had their oral traditions. So they had all those writings and all those oral teachings, and that's what they were teaching. Well, none of that stuff has authority. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't speak, quote, ex cathedra. It doesn't speak with authority. And they were using Moses' seat in a way to, to presuppose that they had this authority when in actuality they did not. And so that's, it says that they sat in, in Moses' seat. Now, you know, in college, uh, you'll hear about certain chairs, you see. Uh, there's a chair for a chair of biology, or a chair of history, or, or a chair of this or that, literature, so on and so forth. Uh, th those are positions of authority. Uh, in, uh, even in orchestras, or in, in where you have a symphony, or even a band, you'll have first chair, second chair, and third chair, you know, which implies that here's one, let's say you have a first chair trumpet player. Well, he's, he's playing the the main part. He's playing the, the lead or whatever the trumpet piece is there. 
the other trumpet players are playing the harmony parts along with it. So, so you have that kind of thing in our, in our vernacular and when we talk about things, and that's what Jesus is talking about here when he talks about that. So, so here were these folks, these false teachers. Jeremiah writes about this a lot. Isaiah writes about this. Ezekiel writes about these people. Uh, Jeremiah calls them uh, false prophets. He calls them liars. God says they speak for me when I did not speak to them. And so you had that kind of thing going on. Well, here are these teachers, these Pharisees, and they pretend to speak for God when they're not. And the only authority, see, here's the point I want to make. The only authority that anybody has is based upon the Word of God. If it, if it falls outside the perimeters of the Word of God, you or it has no authority. You see, for example, let's take my position. You know, I guess you could, would consider in the Lafayette Church of Christ... I'm the leading teacher, right? I assume that, I'm not sure that's a good title, but I think that's the way most people would assume. The only authority that I would have would be in, in the scriptures as I'm teaching and showing you what the Bible says. If I get outside of that, I have no authority. Elders have spiritual authority. And, and what authority they might have outside of that is not authorized by God. So you see, the only authority that any spiritual leader has is the authority on the Word of God. If he gets outside of that, sometimes, and, and it's hard as a, as a teacher, as a preacher, as somebody who teaches as much as I do and preaches, uh, it's hard sometimes to... to uh, stop and say, okay, here's what my opinion is. But here's what the Word of God is. But that's a good rule of, of way to handle things. You know, sometimes I may stop and say, okay, this is not what the Bible teaches necessarily, but here's what my opinion is. And you all know what we say about opinions. Everybody's got one, right? So, so it, it has no authority. The opinion has no authority. However, if it is thus saith the Lord, then it has full authority. All right. Now, we'll see that carry on to the next point that, that Jesus is going to make here. But he says that these false teachers, he says, they lack that authority. That they don't have it. Now, here's the second thing he says. If you look at the next verse, he says in verse 3, So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they teach. So now you have the lack of authority, and you have the lack of integrity. They lack integrity. Now, when we talk about somebody lacking integrity, we have a name we call them, don't we? That's right. We call them a hypocrite. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Anybody who lacks integrity is a hypocrite. Now, notice what he says here. He says, you must be careful what? To do everything they tell you to do. Now, if you're reading King James, I think King James says uh, do all, right? Uses the word all there. Uh, this translation says everything. Well, did the Lord mean what he said here? Or is this a, kind of a general statement? You remember in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, Jesus says, you've heard it's been said this. But I say this, you've heard it said, do not commit murder, but I say to you, do not get angry with your brother without a cause. And so you have, but now he comes and he says, whatever they tell you to do, you do everything. So you have to kind of pause and think about what is exactly that the Lord's saying here when he says uh, to do everything uh, they tell you to do. And what the Lord is saying, remember they're in Moses' seat. And Moses' seat is the law, the law of Moses. And so what he's saying here, in as far as it fits 
with what Moses teaches, with what Moses wrote, you do everything. Now, what's interesting about this is uh, it doesn't matter about a false teacher. It doesn't matter about a false spiritual leader. If what he says is indeed what the Bible teaches, Jesus said you do it. Because why? It's not about the messenger. It's about the message. You see, a, a scribe could get up and, and teach and say to everybody, the law says to love your neighbor as yourself. Or the law says to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, were they supposed to do that or not? Sure they were. Now, if he started adding all these other stuff, stuff of things in there, that was different. But he's saying here, look, uh, I don't know how many of you know Harvey uh, Floyd. Brother Floyd was a uh, Greek teacher at uh, Lipscomb. By the way, Stan, he passed away. Did you know that? Uh, passed away recently. And, uh, and so he was my Greek teacher there. And I had a lot of different classes with him as well. But I remember one day he said this, and it stuck. And what he said was, even a stop clock's right twice a day. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And Jesus is saying here, look, as long as it squares with what the Word says, you do that. And you don't, you don't go back and say, well, I don't care what he said. You know what he did, or, or you know this or that. So what the Lord is saying, look, you focus on the message. That's what it's about. It's about the message of God. Because the message of God, regardless of who the, the messenger is, is still the message of God. So, he says that you do, and, and look at the phrase here, you must be careful to do. Uh, in the Greek, that's what's called the aorist tense. And the aorist tense is, is a verb which means you do it immediately. And, and it also is present. And, and so it's you, you do it immediately and you continue to do it. You continue to follow it. So he's saying here that you do everything they tell you. It has to do with, this, with the word of God. But he says here, do not do what they do. Don't be like them. Don't follow their works. Now, they may teach you the word of God, and it may be correct in what they say. Uh, <clears throat> when I uh, was in uh, Sri Lanka, um, you didn't go to Publix or Piggly Wiggly or one of those places to buy your groceries. Uh, oftentimes, you had to go to the marketplace. It was an open market. And and when you went there, why there would be chickens hanging, you know, dead chickens where they'd been plucked and still whole, had the head and the feet still on them, hanging, you know, and, and of course flies everywhere because it never gets below 70 over there. But uh, <clears throat> but all these all these chickens hanging and you might go and say, okay, I'd like a chicken and you pick out the one that has the least amount of flies on it. And then they'd take that chicken, and they had a cleaver, meat cleaver, and they'd start whooping on that thing. And the time you got it, you got a big pile of bones and meat. That's what you got. Now, I'm no expert at cutting chicken, but I believe I could do a better job. But anyways, when you got that chicken, you took it home, and you put it in a pot, and you boiled it, and you ate it. Well, when they dipped it out to you over there, you got bones and... and uh, might have even had a few flies in, I don't know, but, but you had the bones and chicken in there. And, and what I learned and what you have to do is you have to spit out the bones. Now, the same thing is true in teaching. Um, sometimes I'm asked by people about commentaries, buying commentaries. And uh, I'm always hesitant about commentaries because, let me tell you, commentaries are human works. That's what they are. So they have, they have error. They have uh, sometimes some wrong conclusions. But, but as long as you recognize that, 
you eat the meat and you spit out the bones. And, and so I have commentaries from all kinds of different people from different faiths, and I read them, but I've learned through the years to spit out the bones. Well, that's what Jesus is saying here to these folks. Look, you spit out the bones. You eat the meat, but you spit out the bones. That is, you don't do what they do because they're hypocritical, because they don't do what they say they do. So you be careful in that. So they lack this uh, integrity, and they were hypocrites about it. And so the Lord says that doesn't make them qualified spiritual leaders. He says, for they do not practice what they preach. And that's important. Now, here's the third thing I want you to see. Not only did they lack authority, and not only did they lack integrity, but they also lack sympathy in the next verse. Uh, notice what he says there. He talks about them binding heavy burdens. Uh, Verse 3, 4. Uh, they tie heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on the other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Now, if you were to go over in some of the foreign countries, particularly third world countries, how we classify third world countries, if you were to go to a third world country, you probably would see somebody with a donkey, and that donkey would be loaded down and you would see something you don't see around here. If you see a, a donkey around here, it's usually out in somebody's pasture having a good time. But over there, they use donkeys as beasts of burden, and they will pile things up on those. I've seen donkeys who had piles upon them that you couldn't even see the donkey, and, and, and the burdens are stacks. It was beyond me how they could get everything they had to fit on there. Apparently, they were experts at tying ropes and things like that as well. And here's this donkey. He's leaning about 10 degrees this way because he can't straighten up, and he's got this heavy load. Um, and, and that's the picture the Lord's painting here. He's talking about these, these teachers who are burdening, burdening people, and they're loading people down like, like they did the donkeys, and they pile all this, all this up on them. They pile all these regulations and all these traditions and all these rules upon them. And they say, you've got to do this and you've got to do that and, and you can't do this and you can't do that and you better not think this and that. And so you had all that. And here's the thing about that kind of thing. Legalism is what we might call it. It always brings about guilt. Guilt. And so not only do they have all these regulations and rules and, and traditions, and they also have this burden of guilt because they know they can't keep all that. It's impossible to observe all that. They can't even remember all that. And when you have to have a book so to tell you everything you've got to do every day, you're in trouble. And so they have the addition, additional burden of, uh, I, I may need to turn around and go the other way, Paul. Uh, the additional burden there of uh, of guilt. So so you have that now. <clears throat> um, these teachers were teaching uh, things like now God's in heaven. See if this sounds familiar. God's in heaven, and He's keeping account, and He's got one list over here all your bad stuff, and then He's got another list over here all your good stuff. And whichever list is the biggest is the one that's going to win. Now, that sounds like a whole lot like people today, doesn't it? That's how a lot of us, we view God today. We, we think God's looking at our bad list and he's looking at our good list. Has it ever dawned on you God wiped out that bad list? Amen. You ever thought about that? When you became a child of God, the blood of Christ did what? He wiped out all that bad list. That's all gone. What do you do? You keep looking at that bad list. God says, what bad list? So, so what we're talking about here is grace. They, they were not being taught about grace. 
They were not being taught about the love of God. They weren't being taught about forgiveness. Instead, they were being taught all these things that they had to do. You know, pray five times a day. Kneel so many times every day. Uh, be sure you do this every day. Make sure you wear these kinds of phylacteries every day. And so they had all these things that are going on. I love Peter. The book of 1 Peter. 2 Peter. Both great books. You know what Peter said? See, they, they, they would have never heard this. They would have never thought about this. Peter said, cast all your care upon him because why? He cares for you. They, they never heard that. That wasn't something that they were familiar with. But that's what Peter taught. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4 about these folks. He said, you're being forbidden to marry you're being forbidden to, wear, to, to eat certain foods. All that was silly stuff. You can't marry. You can't eat this food. You mean I got to eat fish on Friday? By the way, I don't have a problem with eating fish. <laughs> but there are people who list all these things, you see. All these rules, all these regulations, and all these things you got to do. And Oh, they may look pious on the outside, Jim. They may look really holy. You know, they even got a conservative haircut. Right, Paul? <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't wear a mohawk that's, you know, dyed neon green. They look really nice. But it's the inside. Look down, if you will, in the same chapter here, chapter 23. Look down at verse 23. And he talks about these folks and, and how really rotten they are to the core. So you see there were those who were... Uh, false leaders they, they are all these folks they lack uh, the authority they didn't have the authority because they didn't back it up with us they, the Lord uh, they, they lacked integrity because they didn't uh, walk the walk and, and they lacked sympathy because they would not help these others here now if you look down the last part of verse 4 it says here, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them, that is to move these burdens. Uh, the word move there is actually a word which means to remove, uh, not just to move one way or the other, but to remove, to, to take away. So he says they lack sympathy. Now, i got two minutes left. Look at verse 5. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and tassels on their garments long. All right, now, what's he saying here? Well, in this text here, he's talking about they lack spirituality. You see, for them, it's all about show. It's all about being seen of men. Remember, Jesus talks about these folks. We talked about this uh, last Sunday night in uh, Matthew chapter 6. Uh, they pray to be seen of men. They give their alms to be seen of men. They fast to be seen of men. Uh, they don't have any spiritual depth about them. All they want to do is, is to be seen by people. Uh, if you were in the temple during that day, uh, if you went into the temple area called the Court of Women, and that was the court where basically all Jews could go, men and women and Jews. You had the outer court, which was the court of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles could freely roam and go. And then the other court would be the court of the women. Then you would have the court of the men and then the priests and so on. So in the court of women, they had aligned along the walls all these uh, vessels uh, all these places where you could give your alms. And so what they would do, here would be some guy, he'd come in, and he would have with him a trumpet player. And whenever he got ready to, to, uh, to give his alms to the poor, he'd find a vessel that was probably the most crowded around, and he'd have this guy blow this trumpet. And then he would make a great show, and, and he would write out his check, and, and he would... Show it to everybody, here it is, and then he'd drop it in there. I guess that's where we got the statement, toot your own horn. 
But anyways, he, uh, he would do that. And he would do that to be seen by men. He didn't have any spirituality about it. All he wanted to do was be noticed. And so the Lord says, it's everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries. Well, we'll stop right there. Uh, we'll pick up next week in verse 5.